terms of bonding, we look at ionic compounds as well as covalent compounds. Um, and this relates to a concept called electronegativity. Electronegativity relates to the tendency of an atom to um, attract electrons. Um, and fluorine is the most electronegative element in the periodic table. You just got to know that. Um, and a difference in electronegativity can determine whether the bond is ionic or covalent. Typically, if you have, um, I think if, it's, if you have a larger difference in electronegativity, it's ionic because um ionic bonds are pretty much having both metal and a non-metal and if you look at um electronegativity in the periodic table um electronegativity increases as you go towards the right so so as you go um, across a um, period so therefore if you have something like sodium and chlorine both of which are on opposite sides sodium being not so electronegative and chlorine being very electronegative, you actually have an ionic bond being formed because there's that large difference. Um, and that's pretty much ionic bonding. If you have a smaller difference in um, electronegativity, so let's say um, it's between, let's say actually we're doing, um, I'm just trying to think of a compound. Um... This shouldn't be this hard. Um, let's say NO2, right? Nitrogen and oxygen are next to each other. So they have really similar different, not really similar differences. They have similar electronegativity. So therefore, um, they will form something called covalent bonds. Ionic bonds are also the transfer of electrons from metal to non-metal because um, non-metals like to um, accept electrons, metals like to donate electrons, um, and you have a smaller difference in electronegativity for covalent bonds, um, and this is pretty much where you share electrons. And adding on to ionic compounds, um, you can define the bonding as electrostatic attractions between a cation and an anion. So a cation is something that is positively charged, an anion is something that is negatively charged. And you can see that over here. Um, if we look at um, NaCl over here, you have a sodium um, ion and a chlorine um, ion. And you can see here that there is one extra electron over here in the sodium ion. And what happens is that um, the sodium gives the electron to chlorine and therefore you form an ionic bond. And that is how you form sodium chloride. And you can see here that it's accepted that electron. Like I said, covalent compounds have um, shared electrons um, and specifically the valency electrons. So the valency electrons are electrons that are in the outer shell. The only thing that matters in bonding is the valency electrons, not these ones in the um, inner shells. So just make sure you're aware of that. Um, and because they are pretty similar in terms of where they're located in the periodic table, they tend to have a lower electronegativity difference. So yeah, and you can see here that um, the electronegativity difference tends to be like 0 0.5 or 1.7, and then for ionic, um, it's greater than 1.7 because of, you know, you're having both a metal and a non-metal, whereas here it's two different non-metals. Um, and Adding on, covalent bonds can be polar or non-polar. So I will also explain that later on. Module one um, has a bunch of different stuff, but I feel like the most important section is probably this one because this really, like understanding this is really going to help you in year 12. So make sure you're, I guess, thoroughly um, prepared across this topic. Um, bonding, the bonding that we've seen so far, so, um, ionic and covalent are something called intramolecular forces. These are forces between, sorry, not between, within molecules. So between, um, two different atoms. Intermolecular forces is when you have interactions between two different molecules. So let's say two different molecules of water. That's the kind of interaction that we're talking about. It's, it's really important that you know the difference. Um, so 
Examples of the forces are things such as covalent bonds, which I've explored, and then ionic bonds. Intermolecular has three kinds of forces. These forces tend to be tested more often than ionic because these really um, can like be tested in really different ways in the exam. So there's three kinds. Um, you have dispersion, dipole, dipole, and hydrogen. Dispersion forces are the weakest, followed by dipole, dipole, and then hydrogen bond is the strongest. So this increases in terms of strength, if that makes sense. Um, dispersion forces um, occur in all molecules, all compounds and substances. So if they ever ask you what intermolecular forces um, will this compound have, you will immediately need to write dispersion. Dipole-dipole bonds um, occur um, in polar molecules, um, and I'll explain what polarity is. Um, and hydrogen bonds is the strongest intermolecular force. Um, and that only occurs between a few sets of um, molecules. Um, I think I do explore that later on. I'm just quickly checking because if I don't, it's going to be a mess. Okay, I don't. So let me further um, explain it. All right. Um, I haven't written this down, so just note it down as I'm explaining. Hydrogen bonds occur between a hydrogen atom and an oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen atom. Make sure you note that down if you don't ask me um, through slider. Um, and dipole dipole bonds only occur in polar compounds. And hydrogen bonds also occur only in polar compounds. So note that down. All right. Um, Another set of bonding is also looking at physical properties, and that's also called allotropy. So allotropy pretty much explores different um, chemical structures of atoms as well as elements. Um, and that's pretty much where it appears in different forms. So you have um, allotropes with different substances. The main ones that we really focus on in E11 Chem is carbon and silicon. Um, carbon's probably the more common one. Um, so allotropes of carbon include graphite and diamond. These have different um, bonding, so therefore they're going to have different physical properties. Um, in terms of structure of diamond, it has a complex network. And then for graphite, um, it's pretty much like sheets but they're connected to one another sort of. So therefore it's like weaker bonding than diamond and therefore it can be easily disturbed. That's why graphite is softer and diamond is very hard. And if you you know put pressure, it's gonna break, it's brittle. Um, so yeah, um, and due to the structure, sorry, not diamond's not brittle, graphite is brittle. I think I'm just confusing it around. Diamond has a pretty solid structure. It, it's like a network over here. Um, and therefore it's pretty hard to break. Graphite is not really connected, so therefore it's brittle. That's why you can, um, you know, if you use pencils, you can see that if you put enough pressure, that graphite will slowly start to crumble. Um, that's because of its weakened bonding. Diamond, on the other hand, um, if you put a lot of pressure, only if you put a lot of pressure will it break, otherwise it won't. Um, and obviously it's used in jewelry. Um, you also have other kinds of networks. So we look at um, ionic and covalent networks as well as metallic, metallic structures. Um, ionic networks are pretty much lattices that you see in ionic compounds. So what happens is that you have, you know, cations and anions and it just alternates throughout the grid. So in, let's say, a sodium um, crystal, what it looks like is actually as a network. So you have sodium and chlorine ions just repeating and it's held by ionic bonds obviously because ionic bonds are so strong and note that intramolecular forces are stronger than intermolecular forces um it's gonna have high melting and boiling points um but it can't conduct electricity when it's as a lattice because 
you're sharing um, electrons. There's no free electrons floating around. And without free electrons floating around, um, you're not ever going to conduct electricity. So that's why ionic networks only conduct electricity when they're in a liquid state, not when they're in a solid state. So like as a crystal. Um, and they're also brittle because when you hit by a force, um, the ions that have the same charge pretty much repel against each other and that just breaks the lattice. So that's why they are brittle. Again, if you're not understanding this, let me know and I can re-explain this. Um, and yeah, this is what the lattice looks like. Covalent networks um, are pretty much lattices, but with non-metals. So they have a bonding called continuous covalent bonding. Um, and covalent networks are pretty strong, so therefore they have a high melting and boiling point, but they don't conduct electricity because in a covalent bond, you're literally sharing electrons. There's no electrons just roaming around, so therefore you can't conduct electricity. And if you don't know what electricity is, electricity is just pretty much just a current of electrons. That's all it is. Um, so without electrons, no electricity, in essence. Um, and an example of a covalent network is diamond, because diamond is pretty much just carbon um, atoms joined together like this. You also have something called covalent molecular. So in this case, you have a weaker covalent bonding. So as a result of the weaker bonding, it's pretty malleable. You can um, allow it to move. Like, for example, graphite is an example of covalent molecular because it has that weak bonding um, it's not going to, um, be as strong and it's going to be able to move because they can just slide over each other. Um, so yeah, and it's not really, um, very strong either. It doesn't conduct electricity either. However, if it is an aqueous solution and it goes into its ions, then it can conduct electricity. And an example of that is HCl. Um, so HCl pretty much associates into H plus and Cl minus. When they are ions, what happens is that um, the cation, which has more electrons, will just give away its electrons in um, solution um, to the chlorine. And um, when it's doing that, you have just free electrons roaming around in that solution. So therefore, it can conduct electricity. Um, and an example of covalent molecular is also ice. You also have um, metallic structure. So metallic structures are a bit weird. Um, I don't know if I'm just going to... Do I have an example of metallic structure? No. I can show you what the metallic, metallic bonding model looks like. Um, it's pretty useful just to look at it. So... This is pretty much what um, a metal would look like. Um, so you just have cations surrounded by a sea of delocalized electrons. So that's what the metallic bonding model is. And since it's delocalized, meaning that, you know, the atoms aren't just holding onto the electrons themselves, um, they're pretty much floating around and it can conduct, uh, conduct electricity. Um, and... All of these ions are held together by a strong electrostatic attraction. Um, and like I said, it can conduct electricity. It's also malleable and ductile. Since you have these free floating electrons, even if you put pressure on it, it can just adjust itself um, and bond with the ions again. Um, and because they have such strong attractions, you have high melting and boiling points. <laughs> 